Χριστό το δίμα εκ παρθένου τεχθένη σε μνή Μαγδαλινή κολούθης Μαρία αυτού τα δικαιώματα και τους νόμους φυλάτουσαν ο Θεός ημερών την After, uh, I guess the last time we talked was a few weeks before Pascha, at least for me. <laughs> and uh, hopefully everyone had a uh, spiritually profitable great event and, uh, and are having a spiritually profitable Pascha tide. It's always uh, as important, if not more important, to be, uh, to be as diligent um, after the fast as we are before the fast. Um, we can maybe sometimes get a little bit carried away in our uh, in our joy and in our celebration, and you know, get to the point where we kind of uh, you know we regret, we regret and feel like maybe we have lost some of the progress we made. So I would exhort you to uh, to stay watchful, <laughs> uh, even amongst your uh, your joy, as it were, everything in measure. I'm going to speak to you today about the uh, the holy myrrh bearing women, or the Sunday of the the myrrh bearers, which we celebrate this Sunday. Um, it's not exactly accurate to say just the myrrh bearing women, because we actually have two men that are also commemorated on this Sunday, and um, that we can include as myrrh bearers in some sense. Um, and uh, I'll mention who those are when I sort of mention who all of the, uh, the Murberry women are. So the first thing I wanted to do, if my computer isn't frozen up on me, which it seems to be, um, I'm just going to read the, uh, the Gospels for um, Sunday, the Matins Gospel and the, the Gospel from the Liturgy. So I'm just going to step out of the screen for a minute to grab a uh, paper copy of the Scriptures. <laughs> So, for those of you with copies of the scriptures who might want to follow along, um, we're looking at, we'll read the, um, the Gospel from the Liturgy first, and we'll go right into the Gospel from Matins, because uh, despite the fact that we read them in the other order, um, it, the, the two Gospels just line right up. So we're going to look at Mark 15 and begin in verse 43. So this is the, the Gospel for Sunday for liturgy. Okay. Joseph, a noble counselor who was from Arimathea, and who himself also was waiting for the kingdom of God, came, and having become bold, he went into Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus for himself. And Pilate wondered if he were already dead, and having summoned the centurion, he questioned him if he died not long ago. And having come to know it from the centurion, he granted the body to Joseph, and he bought a linen cloth. And he took him down and wrapped him in the linen and laid him in a sepulcher, which was hewn out of a rock, and rolled a stone against the door of the sepulcher. And Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Jose, were beholding where he was laid. And the Sabbath having passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Iacobus and Salome, bought aromatic spices that they might come and anoint him. 
And very early in the morning on the first day of the week, they came to the sepulcher after the sun rose. And they were saying among themselves, Who shall roll away the stone from the door of the sepulcher for us? And they looked up and saw that the stone had been rolled away, for it was exceedingly great. And after they entered into the sepulcher, they saw a young man sitting on the right, clothed in a white robe, and they were amazed. And he saith to them, Cease being amazed. Ye are seeking Jesus, the Nazarene, who hath been crucified. He was raised. He is not here. Behold, the place where they laid him. But go and say to his disciples and to Peter, that he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall you see him, even as he told you. And they went out and fled from the sepulchre, and trembling in ecstasy held them fast. And to no one did they say anything, for they were afraid. And we'll continue now with the, the Matins Gospel. Now after he rose early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons. He went and brought tidings to those who had been with him, who were mourning and weeping. And they, having heard that he liveth, and was seen by her, disbelieved. And after these things, he was made manifest in a different form, the two of them as they were walking, and went into the country. And they went and brought tidings to the rest. Neither did they believe them. Afterwards he was made manifest to the eleven themselves, as they reclined at table, and he reproached their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believed not those who saw him after he was raised. And he said to them, Go into all the world, and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. The one who believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but the one who believeth not shall be condemned. And these signs shall accompany those who believe. In my name they shall cast out demons. They shall speak in new tongues. They shall take up serpents, and if they should drink anything deadly, in no wise shall it harm them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall be well. Then indeed, after speaking to them, the Lord was taken up into the heaven and sat at the right of God, and they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, confirming the word by the accompanying signs. Amen. So I think it's important first to uh, to have that in mind, those uh, those two very beautiful gospel readings. And the fact is, uh, while maybe it seems a little bit long to sort of have read it all together, it's amazing how many, well, life-changing events, I guess you could say, creation-changing events happen in the space of, you know, the end of chapter 15 and chapter 16. And we're, we're taken, you know, through all of this in the reading, right from the, the body of Christ being requested um, to the various murmuring women and on their way there. We see the, uh, the, with the stone being rolled away, who shall roll away for us the stone, what is very great, and the angel and his proclamation to them. And, um, and the, our Lord's appearing in various forms to various people, uh, to different murmuring women, to some disciples on the road, which we learn in Luke's Gospels, the road to Emmaus, uh, as well as to the, the apostles themselves. Um, and then we also get the Great Commission at the end of this, to go forth um, into the world to proclaim the Gospel to all the create to creation, baptizing in the name of the Father and the Son of the Spirit, um, all of these kinds of things contained in this. So, I mean, it's a very, very significant passage. Um, and that's why we read it in these sort of preceding Sundays after Great Lent. Now, um, I sort of was peeking around a little bit in terms of, you know, why this Sunday on this day. And, well, if you, I suppose if you um, read through the Synaxarian, you'll get a, a better overview of it. Um, one person commenting on it, a priest, um, made a comment that I thought was, was quite interesting in terms of why uh, why do we have Thomas Sunday, uh, this previous Sunday, before we celebrate the Merbears when chronologically, obviously, the Merbearing women uh, came first um, and, and Thomas was eight days later. But we know in that sense, because of the eight days, that's significant, the sort of literal eight days. But he suggested that um, it was also because, or could possibly be because, uh, the confession of 
Thomas of the uh, the divinity of our Lord, my Lord and my God, is, is such a significant uh, interpretive key, as it were, for us that we need to sort of have this clearly in our minds um, when this uh, when we interpret the events of uh, that have taken place for us, that we not be filled with the sort of early confusion that some of the myrrh-bearing women were. Uh, as they ran to and from the tomb, they saw, saw the angel. They're looking for the body of Christ. Some of them, some of them understand that Christ is risen. Others have left in an ecstasy and, and, and don't quite understand what's going on. And when we read uh, all of the gospel accounts, and not just the one from Mark that we read today, and we put those together, we can see that the scene uh, was fairly chaotic. And uh, that each of the evangelists are, in many cases, emphasizing slightly different uh, times or slightly different groups of myrrh-bearing women that were coming and going. Uh, and, and one really does need to read all of the accounts together, as St. Gregory Palamas says, in order to sort of understand really what's going on and see how the, uh, what's going on with the descriptions of the evangelists, um, because otherwise they would even seem contradictory in points. And so this is how all of our scriptures are meant to be read as a, as a side note. We don't just take one isolated passage or even one isolated gospel to the exclusion of everything else, but that we understand that uh, the various books of the Holy Scriptures illumine one another, and uh, the various passages in Holy Scripture illumine one another, as it were. Uh, and this is ideally how Holy Tradition in general works, to also help to illumine the, the difficult things within Scripture, um, but just in our Christian life in general. Um, so that was the, the first thing I wanted to sort of put it, at least in our minds, what it is we're exactly celebrating. So why the, the murdering women? Well, we read in the passage that they, um, I think in this translation it said, you know, fragrant ointment or something like that. You'll find sort of different versions for this, for the, the translation of the word mark, this fragrant oil. And so... Um, First of all, it says the women, you know, carried this ointment or they carried spices to anoint the body of Christ. And this was um, the sort of common practice, the pre preparation of the body for burial, which involved this, uh, the anointing, the wrapping of the body. And in the shroud, we hear the angel say, come and see the, the grave clothes that lay there. St. Gregory Palamas, in his homily on, the, on the, this Sunday, points out that the even the form, uh, it, that it looked more like a cast that was left over from the the, uh, the aloe and the, um, I think this is cassia, that was actually used in order to wrap the body, it had actually preserved them as though in sort of a cast-like form. And, and I've heard this in other places by some contemporary elders talking about this topic. Um, and so that's significant, I think, um, for some other reasons we could get into uh, if we wanted to. Um, so just to tell you who the myrrh-bearing women are, because it can be confusing, because the, like as I said, the evangelists are focusing on different aspects, different uh, of the myrrh-bearing women at times. And so I had a list of myrrh-bearing women here to read to you. Things seems a bit frozen up. Um, Will suffice it to say for now, there's, if I can remember them, maybe. There's seven myrrh-bearing women, and the, the two men that I mentioned, one that we heard of, which was Joseph of Arimathea, um, who goes to ask Pilate for the body of Christ and puts him in the, uh, his own, the newly, his own sepulcher, basically, the newly excavated tomb that no body had ever been laid in. The scriptures are clear to sort of point that out, and that's, um, as a way likely to sort of hit home the fact that, oh, there wasn't some other body in there and Christ didn't really die or, or something like that. Um, so he's the one Joseph, and the other is Nicodemus, who we, uh, he's one of the, the Pharisees, one of the teachers, and we see in John's Gospel, I believe it's in chapter 3, where they have this conversation at, uh, at night because Nicodemus is hiding, because the penalty for being a follower of Jesus was to be tossed out of the synagogue. And he, at various points, tries to defend Christ, to sort of point out, is, is this really a just 
thing to be doing considering the kinds of deeds he's, he's uh, working. And they sort of ridicule him and say, you know, are you, a, are you from Nazareth as well? And, you know, things like that. And, um, or from Galilee as well. Um, so, in, but after the crucifixion of Christ, Nicodemus, just like Joseph, becomes very bold and, uh, and is willing, you know, to go and, and, uh, and seek the body of Christ. And, and, uh, and in this way, the church recognizes these two figures, uh, these two men, along with these spice-bearing, these myrrh-bearing women. In terms of the, the seven women, uh, we have uh, Mary Magdalene, we have Mary, uh, Mary, the mother of Jose, we have Salome, we have, uh, tradition tells us, uh, Mary, uh, who's the sister of Lazarus, and Martha, the sister of Lazarus, who Christ rose from the dead. Uh, we read it on Lazarus Saturday. And uh, I don't know how many I said, but there may be more. But key in this list of myrrh-bearing women that I, that I haven't mentioned, but that is also understood from holy tradition, and especially is in the scriptures uh, a bit hidden, and I want to talk a little bit about this uh, today because it's very significant, I think, um, is the Theotokos. That, it, that the Theotokos was among these women as well, the mother of Christ. And this is the reference to Mary, the mother of Iacovus, or Mary, the mother of James, because she was the stepmother, as it were, uh, of James, James being the, the uh, son of Joseph from his first marriage. And so... Um, one might say, well, you know, why is this? Or one, in reading, uh, even reading the Gospels, why isn't this, you know, clearer kind of thing? Well, St. Gregory Palamas says very clearly the reason for this is because uh, while the Theotokos was the most fitting person to have, uh, to have seen Christ resurrect, that the testimony of the mother um, would, would hold less weight for people. And I think we can kind of imagine this, right? Uh, this grief-stricken mother, well, of course, wouldn't she wish that her son was not really dead or that he had come back from the dead? Uh, and these kinds of things, you know, we, for what it, you know, it's human nature that we, we take, in some cases, these testimonies where, you know, maybe there's a strong bond or sentiment wrapped up in it, that we're not really willing to trust it because we don't feel it's as objective. And so St. Gregory points out that the evangelists also sort of understood this, and so as not to cause a stumbling block, they, while they mention her, they mention her in a way that's, um, that's hidden for that reason. St. Gregory will go so far as to say, if one reads the accounts all together, that not only was the mother of God present, which I mean, it would be inconceivable that she wouldn't be. She stood right there at the last moment to, on the, uh, at the foot of the cross. Is she suddenly going to become afraid and, and flee when these other murmuring women are, are suddenly taking, you know, are taking courage, being quite bold, considering they had nothing to expect but to be imprisoned, you know, for continuing to follow this crucified, blaspheming criminal? in the uh, you know, opinion of the Jewish hierarchy and the Jewish law. Uh, and yet they took courage, but it's largely they took courage in following the mother of God and in following her, her strength and her courage and looking to her uh, in this time. And so not only is she present, but St. Gregory will go on to say that she is actually the first one who saw Christ after his resurrection. And that uh, when one reads all of the accounts together, that they they can begin to put this together and understand that um, it's actually the, the Theotokos who was the first to see her, and not, as it sounds like in the English translation of what we read today, Mary Magdalene. Um, if we looked at the Greek, part of it is he's going through the Greek and he's sort of he's um, making a distinction because in some Gospels they say. Um, late on the Sabbath, uh, as as dawn was approaching, or or that kind of thing, or at the first light, um, different expressions like this. I can maybe mention one or two of them for you because I have a homily here, just for this purpose. 
Um, but these kinds of time expressions that he says, if you pay close attention to them, not only are they not contradictory, but they sort of fit together uh, to paint a full picture of, of what's going on. He says, St. Luke says that on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, that's the direct quote, they came to the sepulcher bearing the spices they had prepared. He goes on to say, and St. Matthew says that those who came late on the Sabbath towards the dawn of the Lord's day were two in number. St. John says that it was only Mary Magdalene who came and that it was, quote, morning, even though it was still dark, end quote. But St. Mark says that three women came very early in the morning on the first day of the week. Now, by the first day of the week, all the evangelists mean the Lord's day, Sunday. And they use expressions like late on the Sabbath, early dawn, early morning, morning, and even though it was still dark, referring uh, to this day. He goes on to say, they mean the daybreaking hour when the darkness fights with the light, uh, and the hour when the eastern part of the horizon begins to become light as it, um, as it presages the day, as the day is coming on. Observing from afar, one sees the light changing colors in the east at about the ninth hour of the night, which colors remain into the fulfillment of the, the uh, day three hours later. So he's talking about this sort of twilight of morning and this sort of gradually brightening sky. Um, and he's saying that, that it seems that the evangelists disagree somewhat concerning both the time of the visits and the number of the women that are involved. This is attributable to the fact that, as we said, the myrrh bearers were many, that they did not come to the sepulcher one time only, but two and three times, and not always in the same group. That all the visits were at dawn is the case, but that not that they were at exactly the same hour. Mary Magdalene also came by herself without the others and stayed longer. Each of the evangelists, therefore, relates one journey of some of the women and leaves the others. Consequently, by comparing all the evangelists, as I said before, I conclude that the Theotokos was the first who came to the grave of her son and God, together with Mary Magdalene. Now, I remember reading this homily early on, uh, you know, years ago, but early on becoming Orthodox, and this was so significant to me um, because the, the, the view of Scripture that we see in the Holy Fathers is one where we don't just easily explain things away in the sense of, well, oh, I guess maybe they just made a mistake here and contradicted each other. Whether the tradition of the church uh, and, and the saints of the church hold the Holy Scriptures in such a high regard and have such a deep knowledge of them, both through their study but through their personal experience of living the spiritual life, um, that they're able to give these sort of incredible insights that those of us reading uh, I would even venture to say, probably wouldn't be able to put together by ourselves. You know, add to that the fact that we're talking about uh, one of our greatest theologians, a saint who, from reading his life, we know, uh, had many uh, visitations from saints, uh, the Mother of God, all of these kinds of, uh, you know, amazing spiritual experiences that accompanied his deep spiritual life and his theological formation. And so, it was further significant to me, especially as I grew in orthodoxy and understanding this, you know, what it meant that St. Gregory was, was pointing this out, because the testimony of St. Gregory is, uh, is so great uh, that you know, the fact that he, he is pointing this out for us is, is just a tremendous blessing. And so, despite the fact of what our human mind might say when we read it and say, well, I don't necessarily see that, or... You know, especially if we're not reading the Greek text, because it becomes a little bit complicated with these sort of little phrases and things. Or when we hear other other theologians or other uh, people who are either unaware that St. Gregory teaches this, um, and that there's this tradition of this, or for some reason, you know, God forbid, but maybe it does happen, you know, maybe think that they understand it better than he does. And so... Um, I, I wanted to sort of open your eyes to this if you haven't heard this before, because not only is, is St. Gregory claiming it's the scriptural witness, but he's also claiming it's, it's the most fitting thing to have happened. 
that yeah, it, it's the new Eve who is the, the first one to see uh, her son, the new Adam, resurrecting in this sort of restoration of all creation um, th that's kind of going on, this um, turning from, from lamentation to joy, the tears of the first Adam and Eve by the second Adam and Eve. Uh, and so, in that way too, I, I just think it's uh, it's very beautiful. <laughs> and so, Saint Gregory will go on to sort of describe this a little bit further, so that we kind of we understand exactly why he and how we can understand that it is the the Theotokos, the Mother of God, who first sees her son. Um, another uh, point from Holy Tradition is that if one reads the uh, in the, one of the canons of St. Romanos the Melodist, there's a, an English volume, I think they're called um, Chanted Sermons, they're by Father Ephraim Lash. And, uh, and in, his, in the one, um, I think it's called The Lamentation of the Theotokos, where it's these last moments of Christ and her interaction with him, Christ says to her there, um, you will be the first to see me after I arise. And so I always found that significant too after I'd heard that because these are the kinds of things we begin to sort of look through holy tradition to, to listen for because um, many of these things are contained there if we are, if we're paying attention, I guess. And so I would, uh, maybe this is eye-opening for you, I would exhort you to, to sort of read and, and to sort of revel in, in these kind of uh, wonderful things and going deeper in your own sort of knowledge of the scriptures uh, and these kinds of things. Now, something that, uh, that stood out to me as I was doing some of my readings on this um, were one phrase that we, you, you maybe have heard it, and I just think it's very significant, is this idea of the myrrh being the apostles to the apostles. It's just such a beautiful image. Uh, and just such a beautiful, so beautiful in the economy of God and in, in the economy of our salvation. You know, um, I think maybe I've mentioned it before in other talks that, you know, sometimes there can be a temptation, especially in our modern world, um, to say, oh, the church, uh, including the Orthodox Church, you know, holds women in very low esteem, uh, you know, doesn't... Uh, basically that women are sort of second-class uh, citizens, as it were. And it's things like this in our tradition, this, these notions of the apostles to the apostles, that it was in fact the myrrh-bearing women that at first received the good news, the gospel, and then preached it to the apostles. Um, that these things all testify uh, to the place of, of women. Uh, the fact that, you know, the Theotokos is the first to see Christ arise, and that the the most perfect human being, you know, you know above the the God man who is both perfect God and perfect man, is a woman, is his mother, uh, and that she holds a place higher than the highest ranks of angels. So I don't think I think we ought to be careful not to confuse um, hierarchy for some sort of subordination or particular roles or, uh, or jobs, as it were. So ways of serving as somehow um, making one or the other you know, less worthy before God. And we see this in other places, but I just wanted to sort of point that out as a, it's a good thing I think you can mention to, to your friends maybe who, who aren't believers or who criticize the church, especially because they're thinking not necessarily the Orthodox Church by itself, but all forms of Christianity they see, and so um, they sort of hold this up, but I think when we, we turn to them and offer them the Theotokos, uh, it's much harder for them to, to make those kinds of um, maybe criticisms, as it were, and it allows us to encourage ourselves as well. But part of, uh, in my reading, the, the sort of extension of that, okay, so that's one great thing, but, but what are we to take then from these apostles to the apostles? What makes them so significant? What makes them... Uh, why? What made them worthy to, to to become this? Just because there are women? Well, no, because as I said, we have two men included in this as well, though maybe their role is uh, is a little different. Um, 
but it's precisely as we read in a homily by Metropolitan Philaret of uh, Eastern America in New York. He was a first hierarch of the Russian Church abroad, and a great figure. Um, he talks about the murdering women in this capacity as a model of fidelity, a model of faithfulness to our Lord, a model of devotion, uh, a model of courage, which is something I think, uh, you know, it's something that we could all be encouraged by, is this idea of these sort of these courageous figures, because I think many times in our own days we can feel very oppressed by things. And we can feel afraid, you know, especially the, the more unpopular it becomes to be an Orthodox Christian, to hold to the values of traditional Christianity and traditional Christian spiritual life and dogma. Um, we need to increase our courage. And so in the murdering women, this is what we find. I've already mentioned it a little bit in the sense that these women were, you know, if not hunted criminals, they were just about to be you know, in light of what had happened. Not only that, you're thinking of a society where women didn't go out by themselves, as, as I understand it, uh, you know, without, in, without being in the company of men most of the time. And yet we find these women, not only uh, are they not going in the company of the men because the men are off hiding in the upper locked room, um, but they're going out in the middle of the night you know, they're going out when it's still dark out. They're going out to uh, possibly confront the hostile soldiers who are who are standing guard. And so I think we really, we, I don't think we should just sort of breeze over these myrrh-bearing women, these equal to the apostles, many of whom bear that title, um, because, you know, what they did was extremely extremely significant. So I just wanted to read you a little passage from Metropolitan Philad on this because I think it's very beautiful. I think we can all benefit from hearing the words of uh, those that are spiritually more experienced than we are and certainly spiritually more experienced than I am. So let me read a little bit for you. So Metropolitan Philaret, in quoting uh, his own spiritual image uh, says, the most blessed Metropolitan Anthony uh, Krapovitsky is who he's referring to, pointed out how much fidelity to truth and infidelity to it mean to a man. Fidelity that is constant and firm in all things is the opposite of the cowardice of infidelity. Such was the case here Lydica Anthony said, with the Murbury women. The apostles, rather than following their teacher when he was arrested, fled in various directions. When the Lord went to raise Lazarus, the apostle Thomas said, sort of famous saying we all are familiar with it, let us go that we might die with him. This did not, to continue with the homily, this did not meet with a single objection from the apostles. This means that they were in agreement with the apostle Thomas. Yet in the Garden of Gethsemane, it came out that they were frightened and they fled. Only the apostle of love, the apostle John, stood up to his fear and was inseparable from the teacher, even to Golgotha, where he stood with the Savior's All-Holy Mother. Yet the apostles fled. And this is that infidelity, that faint-heartedness, which cast a shadow over their eyes. That was noted by Vladika Anthony. I'll just pause to mention how significant this is, even though we may not quite get it. The actions that we commit, whether for good or for evil, can have serious consequences on our spiritual vision, on not just our spiritual vision, on the way we view the world in general. This before, at least in a comment, I think. You know, it's very easy to fall into this temptation, especially in the Western world, this notion that what I think and how I act can somehow be different. That what I believe uh, and then what I go off and do um, 
can you know be held in in some kind of uh, tension that they don't sort of affect one another. So it, as long as I sort of believe in Christ, believe in the faith in my mind, it really doesn't matter if I uh, you know uh, go off and do any form of uh, you know any kind of sin or vice or you know forgetting of God. And I think this is what you know, Vladika Anthony, through Metropolitan um, Filler, is pointing out to us is precisely not the case that it was in this moment of infidelity and faint-heartedness that the actual the, the eyes of the apostles were blinded to understanding what was really going on here and who Christ was. Those who had been the closest to him, who had spent and given up everything to follow him, and yet in this moment uh, completely lose sight of that. How much more for us who maybe oftentimes aren't, certainly giving everything, dropping everything we have to go and follow Christ with everything, you know, to go through hunger and, uh, sh you know, shamefully being treated by the people around us, being mocked, and, and then eventually run off as criminals. Um, so I want us to definitely sort of bear that in mind, to continue a little. But the faithful myrrh bears went with him to Golgotha and stood at the very cross, grieving at the same time trying somehow to relieve by their love and compassion the terrible and superhuman grief of the All-Blessed Virgin Mary. They did not abandon Christ. We know from the Gospel how he was buried. And the myrrh-bearing women saw where he was laid. The apostles were not there. They had fled. The myrrh-bearing women, however, remained faithful to him to the very end and therefore, as Vladika Anthony says, their conscience and their inner spiritual intuition remained bright and clean. I just thought, what a beautiful way to describe that. Their conscience and their spirit and their inner spiritual intuition remained bright and clean. You know, in English we often say bright weak uh, for for um, uh, for the week after the resurrection after Pascha. Um, but we also have it from the Greek as uh, as clean, clean week. I think is how uh, it would be translated to something of that, um, basically in, in that way. And so I just what a beautiful kind of image that this is really what we're doing too after we celebrated Pascha and the resurrection, that we're trying to continue to keep our inner spiritual intuition that we've begun to sort of. I'm not sure how far I got down on it, but. Um, that's okay. We'll just sort of suffice it. Did you did you hear the, the stuff a little bit about um, uh, about this sort of connection again between the way we act and the way we think, or what we think and what we act, and the repercussions of that? Did you get any of that? I'm not hearing you now. Maybe not hearing. Yes, yes, Papa, we okay. did. Okay, good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, so basically, I just went on with that. That's okay. We'll, we'll sort of go from there. But he's he's praising the fidelity of the barbarian women in, in the face of the infidelity of these apostles. And he just, I, I was mentioning just at the end, his beautiful saying of Lydia Anthony that he says, as a result of the barbarian women remaining faithful to Christ, that their conscience and their inner spiritual intuition remained bright and clean, and uh, this was just another one of these phrases that really sort of stood out to me, and it's just a beautiful way of expressing what is meant to happen for us during all of Great Lent, but especially during that intense period of Holy Week and coming to the Resurrection, that we're cleaning our inner conscience and our inner spiritual intuition so that they can remain bright and, and clean in the time uh, through Bright Week and sort of carrying on from there. Um, and so there's not a lot more that I wanted to, to sort of go on other than sort of highlighting just in general the overview of the whole uh, the event and of this idea of this model of fidelity and devotion and of you know as a small point the sort of the, the role of, of women um, but I want us to really to sort of, uh, as much as possible, sort of take to heart, um, as I guess Metropolitan Filler will go on to say in another place, they'll say, remember how important it is to be faithful to God. Fidelity and devotion to Him enlighten the human 
conscience and illumine the human mind. Conversely, when one commits, uh, when one person after another commits acts of infidelity and treason to the Lord and to truth, his soul becomes hardened, his conscience is coarsened and darkened. It becomes difficult for him to recognize the truth, difficult to venerate it. And I, I just, again, such an important point for us to remember. You know, many people fall away from the faith. God forbid we may become people who also fall away from the faith. We make our cross and pray that God will preserve us and have mercy on us. But a lot of the times when someone leaves the faith, they believe it's for just very rational reasons. You know, obviously there's many ways that people come and go. Some people just fall away. But there are people who say, I don't believe any of this anymore. I've, I see things, you know, uh, more truly. You know, I encountered a, an Orthodox fellow who had done many great things, especially online and making many things available. And, uh, you know, through reading Richard Dawkins or something, he was so challenged in his faith that he actually left the, the faith, as far as I understand. Um, but I think what we see here, and what, what Metropolitan Philidor is pointing out to us, is that it's not as simple as that. We think we're thinking things clearly, but what's happening many times, if not every time, you know, I don't know, but many times what's happening is our soul has become hardened because we've been unfaithful to Christ in some way. There's some aspect going on in our life that's blocking uh, the grace of God from working in our lives, that's distance, distancing us from that grace of God, from the Holy Spirit, that then leads to our, our conscience and our minds becoming darkened, uh, difficult for him to recognize truth, difficult to venerate it. And I, again, that difficult to venerate it, it's so evocative of, of a person. The truth is a person. That when we, we, we ought not really, truly to say, what is truth, as Pilate did. But if Pilate had have asked the question, who is truth? Wonder how different an answer he might have been able to get. That rather than sort of presupposing there's me and then there's this object over here uh, that's apart from me, to have seen things uh, in a community, in a communal sort of understanding, in a relationship uh, of persons, my person as a human being and, and the person of truth, uh, who is Jesus Christ. And so uh, just another sort of beautiful and uh, important passage to keep in mind. Something else, uh, you know, we mentioned to you the... Uh, they're them being a model of fidelity and devotion, but I also mentioned them being a model of courage and why that's so important. And I wanted to, to read you something, uh, a little hymn uh, about the myrrh-bearing women that sort of references their courage. Uh, it's one of these ones that probably stands out in your, in your mind when you hear it, anyway. Bringing the spices for your burial, the women came secretly at dawn to the grave, fearing the harshness of the Jews, and foreseeing that the soldiers would protect it, uh, and seeing that the soldiers would protect it, the tomb that is. But the weaker nature defeated manliness, for their loving intent was well-pleasing to God. Fittingly, therefore, they cried, Arise, Lord, help us, and deliver us for your name's sake. This idea that, you know, the, the, the women, the weaker nature defeated manliness. You'll see this a lot through the, the hymnology, referencing, you know, maybe the, the less hardy nature of, uh, of women generally in terms of physical strength a lot of the time. We hear uh, this referenced a lot of the times when we see these great martyrs, these women martyrs who, you know, who suffered uh, under such physical torments that they make sort of reference to saying basically that they overcome the conventions, uh, you know, of, of what, what uh, the nature of women is supposed to be contained to. And again, it's just another testament to, to the strength of the grace of God working in them. And another way of sort of, I think, especially for our ears who are very sensitive to these kinds of inequalities and things, as I mentioned before, um, but sort of this is a way of showing, especially uh, in the time when, when these hymns are being written in the time of Christ, of showing how there isn't this equality, that, that there's this sort of turning on its head of this idea you know, we see that the, the quote-unquote weaker nature is def has defeated manliness. 
And this is the kind of real courage and the sort of emphasizing of this that I, I think um, we need to sort of take to heart and really, you know, uh, be praying for, especially in our days, so that we can we can be like the murmuring women, so that even though we may feel like we're weak, even though we may feel like we're in positions where we don't have a voice, where, you know, who am I? You know, I'm just, you know, I'm a nobody. I'm not important. I don't... Uh, hold any kind of position or, you know, I'm not a, not a beautiful chanter or have a beautiful voice, you know, for a choir or for a, I can't paint icons or I'm not a priest and therefore, you know, I'm somehow not significant. You know, we, we need to turn that on its head through the example of the murdering women and, and, and ask God, how can I become a soldier for you? How can I become a murdering woman? How can I become an apostle to the apostles, as it were. How can I uh, undertake this? Uh, how can I become courageous? How can I undertake this struggle uh, for your sake and for your name's sake? And so I think that's one of the. That's pretty much the main. The main thing I wanted to draw out: a, a little background, and then this idea of the model of fidelity, uh, of devotion, and of courage that's being put before us on this third Sunday. One other small point, and I'll read you another small hymn about this, is uh, I think it's also important for us, and maybe in a time when, you know, uh, depression is so rampant, uh, we can just say melancholy in general. I was at uh, some kind of a secular course talking about mental health and different things like this, and one of the speakers presented that, um, I don't know what it was, by 2020 or 2025, the the most sort of pandemic illness, as it were, was going to be sadness. Yeah, that you, that this was already the movement based on how many people are on antidepressants, how many people are you know you know basically self medicating in, in cases, how many people just in general feel anxious, feel unhappy with their lives, feel unhappy with their with everything. And I think we need to we need to look to the murdering women. You know, who, in their grief at having found that their beloved Lord, in the case of the Mother of God, her beloved Son, is very suddenly and brutally snatched away from them. That for some of them, the hope of everything that they thought was uh, was before them is suddenly ripped away from them because they they didn't understand that. In the same way that in an instant and in a moment, uh, their grief is able to be turned into deep, lasting joy. I think we need to strive, uh, especially after the resurrection, to, to look for Christ, to ask for Christ, to give us this joy of the resurrection, to, to let us experience this joy of the resurrection within ourselves, to feel the presence of God so close, so bright, so clean that we don't want to do anything but cling to Him in, in, in the moments that He's there, you know, present to us. You know, even if we only experience this for a moment, uh, that that we would recognize that while Christ was dead in the tomb, now He's arisen. Where does He rise? Well, yes, He rises physically, but He also arises in our hearts through holy baptism and through the practice of the faith. And every year we can come through this and we can ask Christ to resurrect us, you know, to roll away the stone of the passions that is over the tomb of our hearts that have become dead and lifeless, that we feel like we're empty and we don't have any hope, that he would fill that with the light of resurrection, that he would change their, their, their mourning into joy. Um, and, and that we would hear the words of the hymnology that say to us, why do you still hurry? And I hear in this, why do you still be anxious? Why do we still run around holding on to our worry or our grief? Um, the, the hymn continues, why do you bring spices? That is to say, why, do you, why are you preparing for a funeral? Um, and why do you do this for one who is living? Christ is risen as he foretold. Let your tears cease. They have changed to joy. 
And I think this is what we need to say to ourselves. We need to hear this, especially after the resurrection, and carry this through as much as possible. And, and to keep in mind, the hymn says, Let your tears cease, they have changed to, to joy. And that struck me when I read it because that's an objective statement. Your tears have turned to joy. It's not a subjective one. We would often think, well, my tears, they proceed from me. They proceed from how I think of them. Um, but here we're being told, no, that, there, that, what, uh, that the grief that we have experienced in our lives, the grief that we're experiencing now, that this is only birth, birth pangs. This is the pain of labor as we're waiting to give birth to Christ within our souls. And so I would exhort you on this uh, upcoming Sunday of the Holy Merbears to, to remember, uh, as I said, the fidelity, the devotion, the courage, but also the, the movement from grief into joy, deep and lasting joy that we can hold on to uh, at this time, and that we would all strive uh, for that as we strive to experience and live Christ's resurrection within our own souls. Amen. If you have any uh, questions or comments or anything. Yeah, Papa, while we have just, uh, again, thank you. Um, two quick questions. Uh, why did the mirror bearing mm -hmm. when we go so many times back and forth from the tomb? Is there an explanation for okay. the fathers on this? Yeah, St. Gregory Palamas says uh, a lot of it had to do with the uh, ecstatic experience of having an angel suddenly appear to them. So uh, when we read in the lives of the saints, we often see that, that the saints have ecstatic experiences, uh, experiences of grace or of theoria, and they can come out of it, and uh, you know they don't eat for days. They're unaware of people around them many times. They, um, uh, they're in this sort of... Uh, for lack of a better word, they're in a bit of a stupor, but not a stupor, uh, sort of a holy drunkenness or something like that. A drunkenness in the sense that they've con they're so full of the love of God right now that it's hard for them to, to, to keep human things straight. People talked a lot about, as I've heard, uh, St. John of San Francisco, uh, that after the liturgy, you just couldn't talk to him because he was somewhere else. And he, he couldn't follow even just the most basic kind of questions after the liturgy because he was so fully absorbed. I mean, that he was literally participating with the angels in heaven and all of the saints before the throne of God during the liturgy that afterwards it took time for him to reacclimatize. And so there's something similar that St. Gregory Palamas mentions about the women, that he sort of explains that. They're, some of them are afraid, they didn't understand, some of them are ecstatic, that some of them slip away without the other ones realizing it because they're in this kind of ecstasy of having seen this angel, seen the stone rolled away. Um, and, yeah, so I don't know if that, uh, that helps sort of explain it because, I mean, even he makes reference in Gregory that Mary Magdalene, uh, despite the fact that we, we just read that she was there, uh, her and the other woman and the stone was rolled away and the angel... Um, he points out that if we look at the other scriptural testimonies, we know that she runs to tell the apostles, but she says his body's been taken away. That she didn't either hear or didn't process the fact that there was an angel saying, he's not here, he's arisen. And she's looking for a body somewhere. So there, there's something going on here um, that, uh, that is part emotion, part uh, uh, fear, uh, but also part ecstasy, as it were, from the sort of heavenly vision and from the, the experience of grace. So, yeah, just to follow up on that, so would you say on, on the highest level uh, of the myrrh-bearing women, this uh, revelation of the truth, that, and that the myrrh-bearers being um, apostles to the apostles, this would actually be a way for us as well, before we go out, and start saying things. What level of mirror bears are we at? You know, are we at the the yes. emotional states? Yes. Yeah, I think that's a really good, a really good point. Are we at the stage of revelation and purity? 
Yeah, exactly. St. Gregory makes the point that really it's only the Theotokos who's fully able to process everything that's going on because her soul was so fully prepared for this uh, that it was just the fulfillment of the revelation given by the angel in the first instance. He says that this angel that proclaimed the good news was Gabriel. The Theotokos was very familiar with Gabriel because it was Gabriel who came at the Annunciation as well to, to, to proclaim to her those glad tidings. And so, um, but I think that is a sort of a crucial point for us to, to understand that even an experience of grace, or maybe even especially an experience of grace, can sometimes make us, uh, to a certain degree, uh, unready or unfit to go and immediately, uh, you know, deliver the message that we've received. I mean, I think this is part of the wisdom of our spiritual tradition, which says, if you think you've experienced something, don't tell anyone except your spiritual father. And then when your spiritual father decides whether or not it was from God or whether or not it was from the devil, uh, listen to him. <laughs> and that, that there's this cautionary period after every experience of grace, uh, even ones that in our own souls that we may be completely convinced of, until the moment when in our humility, in our, in our obedience, we lay this at the feet of, our, of a spiritual guide in order to confirm it for us. And, and even at those points, usually the, the spiritual guide will tell you not to pass it on unless he believes it's for the edification of other people and that it won't contribute to your own pride. And so I think we need to be especially careful when we experience things, um, you know, to, to ask a blessing, you know, especially for such a situation, to say, is this good for me to pass on for the edification for other people? Um, you know, how much time should I spend in prayer you know, before I, even if I have a blessing for my spiritual father to speak about it before I speak about it, things like that. So I think it's a really uh, astute observation that we should keep in mind. And just a, a third observation, sort of for not monopolizing this point. So would you say then, you know, because we have to try our very best to take these examples and to apply them for our own lives, and that's more the reason why we have these different Sundays from Holy Fathers, that would you say that our fidelity to the truth is reflected in our the fidelity of our own purity. You know what I mean? Like, you know, as we said earlier, the Theotokos being the most most pure, most immaculate. So of course she understood everything correctly and, and, and most quickly. That our fidelity to the truth is also linked to the purity of our lives. Yes, uh, um, there are many saints who have been saved with only knowing the most bare minimum about the faith, but who lived pure lives and holy lives. There are many people the opposite way who have great theological knowledge but lacking the life are not saved Th that's the difference you know we do need to understand our faith and the more we understand our faith when we're practicing it you know the deeper we can go but better to have a minimal understanding of our faith and, and have great not minimal I mean uh, you know, an appropriate without necessarily reading deep theological, you know, works and becoming proficient in all the theological terminology. Better to have simple, you know, faith uh, by putting all of your energies into living a life of holiness than to have read every work of every single father, have them all memorized as long as well as the scriptures, and you know, be a, become a, you know, a, a bishop or a patriarch or an abbess or something like that, and not live the spiritual life. The one in in the first one you can still be saved, and in the second one you cannot be saved. If we do not put our faith into practice, we will not be saved. Yes, we need to have right faith to build that on, because without the right faith, our life will start to deviate. But the two are meant to work in tandem. But if you're going to err on one side begin erring on the side of practicing the commandments because that alone will help teach you the truth. Because what's revealed through the practice of com the commandments is Christ himself through your own experience because you become like him by practicing the commandments because they are the embodiment of him. And as it says, uh, you know, if we love him, we'll keep his commandments. And what does he promise? He says, and, and myself and the Father will come and dwell in him doesn't say, if you read theological books, myself and my Father will come and dwell in him. But if you love him and if you keep his commandments. So, uh, I don't know if that 
it's a very important point, especially, uh, you know, I think for those of us today who maybe we tend to, it's easier for us to read. This is sort of what we do. We go to school. We get higher degrees. Maybe it's not so easy for us to uh, put these things into practice. Is that? Thank, thank you, Papa. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, you mentioned something. Um, can you hear me, first of all? Can you hear me? Yes, I can. I just okay. put in my earphone more. <laughs> okay. You mentioned something earlier um, when you were talking about um, the women, and then you're talking about how some people in society have, I guess, this bias towards orthodoxy or Christianity in general, where they look at I, I guess they kind of think that women are like, oh, we, we look at them in a, uh, how do I say? Um, this uh, sort of subordinated or... Subordinate way. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, okay. I was, I was going to touch on that a little bit because I've noticed kind of something going on in, from my limited experience living in North America for so many years, right? Um... How am I going to put this? Okay, the first thing I'm thinking of is um, I, I, I noticed that, okay, obviously we're all equal. We all deserve to be treated equally. I have no issues with that. Um, nobody deserves to be oppressed. Nobody deserves to be subordinated. Uh, but I noticed that sometimes with people fighting for equal rights, sometimes it gets out of control and they end up having more rights. For example, I'm thinking of feminist groups, um, the, all these human rights activist groups running around, the G20 and all that stuff going on. And, uh, you know, I see some men becoming more like women. And then I see the flip side, I see women becoming either too manly or too aggressive. You know, uh, and there's all kinds of things going on. I, I read, the reason I bring this up is because I read a, read a homily. I can't remember which priest or monk or elder said this, but he's kind of saying that it's almost become like a, um, where he's quoting the scripture verse from the Apostle Paul in Romans where it says, uh, men left their natural state and burned for men and women burned for women and so on and so forth. And he's kind of getting into the fact that by this happening, it sort of like a disorder where men and women start hating each other or there's an animosity towards each other where it's almost like like a racial it becomes almost like a racial thing so as orthodox christians how do we um i, I well anyhow i guess just explain because i don't i guess you know what i'm trying to say so yes uh, definitely this is sort of an observable phenomena today. Um, it's very prevalent. And again, to be fair, not all of it, lots of it isn't bad. Um, you know, part of the difficulty, especially as human beings, is when we try to sort of compensate for things, oftentimes we take it too far in the opposite direction. And then eventually, well, most ideally anyway, we sort of bring it back, try to bring it somewhere near the middle. Um, but it, it can kind of fluctuate between that. That just has to do with human beings sort of being uh, changeable in that sense and not being perfect. Um, even when we know what perfection is, it's one thing to know, it's another thing to conform yourself to it. Um, but yeah, in, in our days especially, there are, are sort of deeper seated movements that want to sort of, um, just whether cultural trends or or even maybe in UK, you can say some groups sort of forwarding these things, like some of the ones you mentioned, maybe. Um, you know, in particular, and uh, I mean, these aren't things we should be surprised to see because the more we def depart from uh, the church, from grace, and from the protection that that sort of offers us, the living, as I was saying, of the spiritual life, the more that our thinking is going to be twisted. And so, um, you know, in, in the case with some of uh, these movements or some of these groups or, or things like that, I think probably you could quite safely say there's this twisting going on 
that because a person wants to justify a particular kind of moral lifestyle or moral action, or it's probably a better way to say it, that they're, they begin to change how they think about it, so that they can't even see outside of that framework anymore. And, you know, they become a sort of a prisoner to their own presuppositions. You know, in the same way that we're trying to acquire the mind of Christ, um, well, people are acquiring the mind of the world in the same way. And so, uh, I mean, I think that would sort of be one. I think that we shouldn't be surprised by this. This is sort of what will happen when we did. We can look around and say, this is what happens when we depart from the church, when we're not close to Christ, when we're not living the spiritual life. Both the way we think and the way we act is going to radically change, and this is all we're seeing happening. Um, you know, add to that, I think, that there's a phrase that I, I guess I sort of have coined, but I think we we need to sort of maybe take it and, and put, you know, apply it to ourselves as much as possible to, to see how we're acting. But um, I talk about sometimes this idea of the, the uh, intolerance of the tolerant. You know, we live in a society that's all about tolerance uh, until you say something that they don't agree with. And then you're going to, they're going to come down hard on you. And the worst thing is, because they're such a prisoner of the way that they think, they really will think that you're insane. They really will think that you are the, all of the evil things that they'll accuse you of being. Because they can't see outside of the way they think. And, you know, Elder Joseph, you see this in his letters where he talks about it, and he, he would often say, you know, to God, what can I say? Because, uh, or to the people he's writing to, I can't blame these people because they only act as they see, and they believe as they see. And so, I mean, I think that's the, the first point in terms of uh, being aware of, of this sort of movement. Uh, so I think in terms of, okay, what can we do as Orthodox Christians on a practical level? One, uh, not fall into that ourselves. Try not to become intolerant of these people. In fact, we're called to do the exact opposite. We're called to love these people. The people that are the most intolerant towards us are the people that we are called to love the most because that's what we, what we mean by our enemies. You know, those who are hostile to us uh, are the people that we're called to love. Um, so that's the first point. The second point in that, which is, I mean, what am I going to say? Uh, it's not like it's not easy, but, you know, the second point is you have to expect persecution. You know, you have to expect that because they can't understand uh, where you're coming from. They can't understand the gospel, either because their minds have become callous, dark, and all these things that we've mentioned from departing. Or, for, you know, for whatever reasons, maybe because they don't know that they're supposed to love their enemies or don't care. Uh, as a result, you know that persecution will come. And so you, you know, that has to be that we have to prepare ourselves to withstand these storms. We have to stay close to God. We have to, uh, you know, practice the things that are going to get us through these moments that really are crushing when they come. It doesn't, you know, it's difficult. No matter when they come, you may see them coming. You know, you may be warned, you may, all of these things, they still hurt when they come. Um, but at least if we're aware, and this is what we expect, then um, that in and of itself becomes a, a way to strengthen us and to protect us and encourage us to, to um, bind together, maybe. So uh, that's more of a sort of a general principle, though, of how we deal with these kind, all of these kinds of trends that are just going to increase you know, as we come closer to sort of end times, as it were, you know, they're becoming too apocalyptic. This is what the scriptures, the tradition, I mean, sort of teaches well, that we are going to sort of experience. When Christ comes, will they find faith on the earth? Well, that means it's going to be pretty difficult to be someone, if you are lucky enough, or we are lucky enough to be some of them that still have faith, that means all the people around us are going to be, you know, uh, antithetical to that. So, um, I guess that's sort of in a general way. I guess it has one more point. We also need to get in, into our heads, and we have to protest, not protest, but we have to give in um, opposition to this in society, this idea that um, equality means sameness, that the only way that men and women can be equal is if they're some combination of neither, or if, if everyone just becomes men, 
as though this is some way of holding up women's rights is by saying, oh, just become a man. Just take on all the things that men do. You know, and there, and that will somehow validate your womanhood. I mean, it's, I find it very distasteful. Um, I think it's very degrading, actually, to women, you know, to say that they're, to, to look on sort of traditional things that women have done and have taken pride in for centuries, like giving birth, for example, is, you know, while a lot of our society can be excited about it, there's lots of our elements of our society that doesn't look on birth as either anything significant nor something that a, that a, that is you know special that a that a woman has a special role in you know and so I think we keep if we keep that in mind that same equality does not mean sameness but that it becomes equality becomes about learning to value uh, people. In, in the roles that they are, or as they are, as people, and I think that'll help us to deal with these groups and to love our enemies and all these other things as well. And I don't know if that is an answer. Yeah, very, very well. We we shouldn't keep any longer. So God willing, we'll touch base again next week with you. We've got a small change in the schedule to double up with Father John, so then you'll have to double up later on. <laughs> If we can just end with the Christos Anesti, and I will, we'll see you next week. Very good. Christos Anesti, Nekron, Tanato, Tanato, Tisas, Christ is risen, Papa. Truly, He is risen. Christos Anesti. Christos Anesti. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good night. You too.